So, hi everybody, uh, my name is Lynn, uh, Lynn Serfin from Trentino Genealogy, and today is Friday, the 29th of May, 2020. We've almost made it all the way through May, and um, uh, Philo Friday, here we are. You didn't see me last week because I had a tooth pulled back here and I was uh, quite sore. So forgive me for missing a week, but I'm back again. Uh, just again, for th those of you who, um, may not remember or who don't know what philo is. Philo is a traditional practice in Trentino where you tell stories and share oral, oral history, usually done in the evening between dinner and bedtime, which is my time here because I'm in England and right now it's eight o'clock in the evening. And so it's just right in between. Um, I know for most of you it's during the day. But uh, anyway, it's done to uh, to be entertaining, to bring families together, to stay warm in the winter, to pass on oral history, and all of those kind of wonderful things. And so we're, uh, I, I had started these podcasts, I had done podcasts before, but I had started these regular podcasts during the lockdown, when so many of us are feeling far, uh, far away from each other, and in need of some contact, and in this way, it will help bring the community together. Also, we can talk about our ancestors, our, the history of our ancestors, and, uh, and gene genealogical topics. So let's see, anybody else come in the room? Okay, so I'll start from now. All right, well, I was, this week I was supposed to talk about ancestral occupations. I had put those up as the riddles. But yesterday, I found something that, I had to share, and I'm going to start. I am going to talk about the occupations. I'll come to those in a bit, but I I want to start with something different because um, I found something in a book that I randomly picked up. Uh, one of my many books on my library shelf that I haven't read because I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, um, and I thought it was so relevant to what we were talking about last time when I was talking about the plague of 1630. Now this comes from a book called uh, Sentieri Luoghi e, e Paroli, which means Pathways, uh, Places, and Words. It's a second volume, and it's by an author named Mauro Neri. You may remember his name when I um, told you I told you that uh, Philo poem on the very first meeting that we had for Philo Friday. He wrote that poem. Now, he's a very, very wonderful author, and he, he has a beautiful style. It's very um, easy to read. I, he, however, he writes with such imagination. Sometimes I'm not sure whether he's telling, whether it's all fiction or whether it's true. So <laughs> there is one particular story in here that I came across. And hold on, on page, this page. And it's called uh, La Quinta Essenza della Peste, which means the fifth essence of the plague. And uh, so Quinta Essenza means the fifth essence, but if you smush it together, it also comes out quintessence. That's how our word quintessence comes from, combination of these two. And it comes from uh, a long time ago when people used to believe there were four elements, the um, you know earth, water, fire, air. Basically, these were the four elements. And so finding that fifth element was supposed to be the, the quintessence, the quintessence of, of existence. And some people thought that was spirit. Uh, some people thought it was something else, but in this case, it has to do with um, an elixir. And the elixir is, hi Jean, um, the elixir is something that was cooked up to fight the plague. Now it actually was cooked up before the plague of 1630. It was for a previous plague. Apparently, this uh, concoction, and I'm going to read you the ingredients so you can try it at home. <laughs> uh, this concoction was apparently made by the, or made up, by the chief medical doctor who was also a very famous botanist and pharmacist uh, named, let me look up his name, he was very so famous that I didn't know who he was, never heard of him before until this week. Um, his name was Pietro Andrea Mattioli. Now, once I looked him up, I realized he's written hundreds and hundreds of books, volumes and volumes of books on, on herbology, basically, and botany. So he's, if you're into that kind of thing, he's kind of a really important historical figure. He was born in Siena in Toscana in, in uh, 1501, died in Trento in 1577, 78, somewhere in that period of time. He was actually the personal medical physician 
of Cardinal Clez, Cardinal Bernardo Clez, who was the, during the whole kind of, before the, around the, uh, before, actually before the, the uh, Council of Trento, like during the, um, during the rustic wars in the early part of the 1500s and, and later. And he, uh, anyway, he was his personal physician. And apparently this concoction that I'm gonna read you the ingredients of, um, was made for him, I think. <laughs> uh, Neri says that um, it was spoken about first in a book by Aldo Bertoluzzo, or that's where he found out about it. And I've actually found that book uh, from Trento and I've ordered it, so it's coming next week. So I can tell you if I'm wrong, uh, but at least my understanding is that what I'm gonna tell you tonight is more or less the recipe that was written in the 1500s, given to Cardinal Clez as something to ward off the plague, something to get better from it, or either keep it away or make it get better very quickly. So here are the ingredients. Let me, uh, let me see. Oh, by the way, I, I found a new word that I'd never heard of before. Let me look up that word um, of the personal, a personal uh, physician for a king is called an archiatra. <laughs> uh, which in English is an arch, they said archiator, uh, which I'd never heard before, but archiatra is the name of a personal physician for a king and or a prince bishop, which is the same, same kind of level of, uh, of uh, personage. So here we go. Here's, oh, you need a staple item. Okay, so this is an elixir that you're gonna make in a big bottle. So you need a basic ingredient that is at the foundation of it. So what do you think they used? Well, these are, <laughs> this is medieval uh, Trento, Trento, and um, what they're using is grappa. <laughs> so grappa is the foundation of this elixir. Now, the, if you've never had grappa, grappa is what they make from what's left over when they press the, the grapes to make wine. They take everything else, the seeds, the skin everything and they ferment that and it comes out very sweet and very very alcoholic like up to 60 percent and um and it's clear usually clear sometimes you'll see it colored uh, because of different things that they do to it but it's usually really really clear and uh, and traditionally we drink it after after meals it's supposed to help with digestion haha <laughs> they say but at any rate grappa um the kind of euphemistic word for it is aqua de vita which means water of life again haha -ha. but so it's um it's it's a staple of our culture so if you haven't had, had grappa then you should sometime who else is uh, coming in grappa will kick anything out of you exactly robin so that's why it's the foundation of the elixir so you start with a big bottle of nice clear grappa made from the best grapes that's what the is in this story now this is a fictitious story but i believe the recipe is something he's taken from a, a true story. so the story is fiction i'm not telling you the story because that'll take us somewhere else but it's uh, but this is the recipe that's in the story so in the grappa you start off by putting in an ounce of finely ground cinnamon no problem right although think about this and 1500s you know getting all these ingredients just think about how they had to get them so a, an ounce of finely ground cinnamon in the grub sounds fine next ingredient on the list was sandalwood um now i don't know about you but <laughs> i i know that years ago when i i well i knew somebody who dealt in perfumes sandalwood oil is so expensive very very expensive more expensive than gold and um it's it's extremely aromatic uh but that was that's one of the ingredients it doesn't say whether it's the oil or the wood or what but it just says sandalwood you add sandalwood the next thing is cloves now that makes sense we use cloves for infections it helps with pain um next ingredient now it's not saying how much i'm sorry <laughs> unless it's all announced i'm not sure but the next ingredient is Galangal root, is that how you say it? I know I've seen it written down. I don't know if I've ever heard it pronounced, but it's also called Alpina Galang uh, Galangal. And that's something else that you put in. The next one is nutmeg powder. So far, it's all really aromatic. It must, must smell wonderful, sort of, but we haven't finished yet. Okay, so we've got the grappa, the cinnamon, the sandal, the clove, the gangal root, the nutmeg. Now we get to cardamom. But there's two kinds of cardamom. There's 
cardamom maggiore and cardamom, cardamom minore. And cardamom maggiore apparently comes from Sri Lanka, and the other one comes from Kerala, which is South India. So these are not really that close to uh, Italy. So how have they got those? You know, that's difficult. So you're supposed to put two grams of one of the kinds of cardamom and two grams of the other. Now I'm assuming that's ground up cardamom seed because that's what uh, what we usually use. Uh, after that, two pinches of black cumin. All right. You got I hope you're writing this down. <laughs> then after that, some anise seed. OK, and after that, uh, 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 an herb that's quite similar to anise in terms of its taste, finocchio, which uh, that's what we say in Italian, but it's actually fennel seed in English. And it's, it has a kind of licorice-y taste. Um, we'll get to licorice in a minute. So you got that so far? Are you writing it all down? OK, now next, you need a pinch of wild parsnip. Don't ask me. I don't know what that is. Uh, I know what parsnips are, but I don't know what wild parsnip is. Maybe you do. Maybe it's an herb. I don't know. Uh, so next, eight grams of angelica root, something I have on my shelf. I know. Uh, then here's where it starts getting weirder. Um, something called ambretta montana. It's a flower. It doesn't say whether the leaves, flowers, stems, what seeds, whatever you're supposed to put in, but you put that in. Then it says a good chunk of licorice, finely ground licorice. Now I'm assuming that's the root and you know how sweet that is. So it's a finely ground, a chunk, a good chunk. Now here's the next one I haven't heard. I had to look a lot of these things up. Uh, something called Calamo Aromatico, which is uh, in English, they call it sweet flag, another herb. Uh, it's used to treat digestive disorders, but it can be toxic and it's actually banned in the United States. So if you're making this in the United States, you've got to smuggle in your sweet flag. OK, so the next thing is valerian, which I know it grows all over Trentino. It's quite smelly and it makes you sleepy, valerian, if you've ever taken it. Then thyme, some thyme, then some clary sage, you know, the stuff that people wave around to clear the atmosphere, some clary sage. And then some calamint flowers, okay, calamintha. I had to look that up. It's in a lot of botany books as a as as a herbal medicine. Um, then wild thyme. So it's not the same as thyme, and in Italian it's called serpillo. Um, I don't know the difference, but thyme and wild thyme. Then some sage flowers, and I guess that's different from clary sage. And then betony, which is supposed to be a magic flower. Again, I don't know if you're supposed to put the flower or the leaves. And then it says lots and lots of rosemary. So, and I know that rosemary is an antioxidant. It's very good at, at uh, boosting immune system. So lots and lots of rosemary. Uh, and then bug loss, which is another plant I've never heard of. And there's different varieties. It doesn't say, it just says bug loss. Now, here's something that might be a little challenging two grams of powdered cedar bark. So go out, get some cedar bark, grind it up. And then finally, we've got the last three ingredients. And those are the ones that I posted on the on the page. And these are, if I say them right, Dian Margariton or Dian Margariton, whatever, uh, Dian Rodon and Diamber. Now the first one, Dian looks like Margarita, Dian Mar 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 Margariton. It's actually, it's a, um, something called an electuary, which is like a honey syrup thing, el elixir thing made with pulverized pearls. So it's pearls powdered up into some honey. The next one is uh, rose, essence of rose, which is also very expensive um, in honey. And then the last one, diamber, this is the weirdest one of all. It's made from, it's again an elixir in honey made from amber juice. Now, if you know what that is, that's a, it's, it's basically whale vomit. <laughs> it's like, it's sperm whales, they, it, it gets in their stomach. It's, I think it's kind of like the whale equivalent of, of uh, fur balls, if you know what I mean. They, they spit it up and it's like a hard, clear amber. And it can, it can sometimes show up on beaches. I saw an article about a couple finding it on a beach. Apparently it's very, expensive. I don't know why, but it's rare. And uh, especially now with fewer whales, but 
that's the last ingredient the, the amber juice mixed with the honey and so now you put all of that all of that into your grappa and you let it sit there and you let all those nice herbs mix up and then you take out a spoonful of it and you'll never have the plague and you probably won't have anything else either <laughs> you know, but anyway i thought you'd be amused by that because uh, i i found it uh, pretty wild um there you go hi loretta hi nick yes uh anyway did you find that interesting and i hope you wrote it down i can share it with you later but i i shared it with my daughter because she studies herbalism and i thought this is pretty interesting if this is what they were actually doing in the 1500s to ward off the plague pretty expensive and complicated but all of these things are known uh, are used in, in medicine okay so let's shift gears let's shift gears to the occupations i just want to follow up a little bit on the um the article that i published last week about trento the city of trento in 1890 or in the 1800s and especially with regards to the list of occupations i had in 1890 now if you haven't read that article it's the most recent article on the website I'll be publishing another one very soon on the parishes of Trento, uh, uh, but um, hi, Joanne. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll be publishing one very soon on the parishes of Trento, but for now, this is the most recent one. Now, I just want to remind you, I, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things because I didn't really say them in the article. Just a few things to make you think contextually about occupations between the city and then occupations in the rural areas. Now, the first thing is that the total population of Trento in the 1890 uh, census or survey, it was more of a survey, it wasn't really a census, was 21,486. So let's say 21,500, okay? So now of those people, uh, it said that 1,800, over 1,800 of them were the military and that was the top occupation in the city okay we're talking about the city and its surrounding areas not the rural valleys that was the top occupation at the time um i find that very interesting and the the i want to bring it up because you said well why would it be so why would there be so many military in trento at the time now uh, and also they're referred to as single men unmarried men living in military quarters that's what it says it describes them as that way now, it doesn't give any information about them, but we know from the context and the period of time that they had to have been with the Austro-Hungarian army, okay? So, because that's who owned the area at that period of time. So we know that much. Um, now, the other thing is though, if we think about the period of time, so this is 1890, it's smack in the middle of two really big political upheavals. Now, first of all, if you go backwards in time, 25 years in time, uh, so 1865-ish, um, that was the ending of the so-called Wars of Unification. Now that's when Italy took the provinces of Veneto and Lombardia, which are like this and Trentino is in there, okay? So originally, or for a long time, I'll say, um, all those three provinces were owned by Austria or Austro-Hungarian Army or Empire, depending on which period you're looking at, or the Holy Roman Empire, depending on which period you're looking at. And then from 1865, they now became part of Italy and Trento was kind of there like that. So it was in a very precarious position. And believe me, it wasn't all just, okay, you're over here and we're over here. There was a lot of um, shakiness going on. A lot of people were, wanted to be part of Italy, others didn't. Um, and so Austria was, I believe that they probably had the soldiers there because they just didn't know what was gonna happen. Now, to the east, there was also a lot of saber rattling going on with Russia. Eventually all of that emerged into World War I, which was really only 24 years after that too. So we're talking equidistant time periods. Uh, and so, cause, in this period of time also Austria was expanding, trying to expand further and further and further, and eventually it was all going to explode. So, <laughs> so that was one thing. Historically, this was a really important period of time uh, <coughs> in terms of, I guess, a military threat. And that's why, there, I think that's why there was a lot of military there at that time. The other reason is, um, quite simply, if you're going to, um, what's the word? 
not activate, what's the word, deploy. If you're, going to, if you're going to get a whole bunch of soldiers in motion very quickly, they're going to need transportation. And Trento had a railway station. It had opened in 1859. It connected them to Austria, parts, you know, up to Innsbruck and, and onward to Vienna from there. But it, it was really important. The, I think the, I think Rovereto was open at that point as well. But these, that was, you couldn't do that from the rural valleys. You had to be in place like that. So you have to think, okay, that this makes sense. Okay, I can see why they were there. So I'll, I'll come back to the military in a minute because I want to tie it to the next one. I'm not going to, uh, the, um, I'm going to skip the second occupation because I want to go to number three, which was foreign students. Now, I don't actually know because I think it has something in common with number one. I don't actually know what they mean by foreign, whether it means they were from outside of the whole province, um, outside of what was considered Tyrol in general. Um, I don't know if it means just from other parts of the province, outside the city. Don't know. Don't know what foreign means in this context. It just means they weren't native to the city, um, it, but it could mean anything. Now, I also don't know where they were studying. There was the university as we know it today didn't exist yet, but there were academies and there was a seminary. So I'm assuming it had something to do with some of these places. But uh, but the interesting thing is that if you look, let me I've got to look at my glass, uh, put on my glasses now because I have to look at the numbers. If you look at the languages that it says in the survey that is spoken. It says that um, in the city there were 2,350 uh, 2, people, adults this is, who said that German was their primary language. So that means all the other, um, whatever, 19,000, 18,000 something people were Italian was their primary language. OK, so now if you look at and this is where I find it interesting, if you look at the number for the military plus the foreign students, you've got the military is uh, 1800 something and the foreign students is almost 1100 and you put them together, it's 2900 people. Now, that's just a little bit more than the total number of German speakers to me. That makes me wonder if the German speakers in the town in the city at the time were pretty much predominantly coming from these two groups. Now, how do I know? I don't know. But to me, it seems to indicate that. Now, the, the reason why I kind of feel that way is that if you look at any of the documentation in that time, it's all written in Italian. The locals spoke Italian and Italian dialects. Of course, there were some other dialects that had more German in them. But for the most part, um, the people in the area, the native people in the area, were Italian speakers or dialects that were related to Italian speakers. So that's, I'm just thinking that. Now, if you want to follow that up, go ahead. It's just my own thoughts. Uh, so my question, the riddle was, what can looking at these statistics tell us about history? So that's, those are the kinds of things I'm thinking when I'm looking at statistics. I try to analyze them and get a little deeper into them. Now, the second most numerous occupation was domestic servants. And this is actually something I'm going to get into next week. Uh, I'm just going to mention it now because it was important. Um, a lot of young women, especially, I'm sure there were men domestic servants, but an awful lot of unmarried women went off to become domestic servants in wealthier households. Um, I think it also shed some light on the fact that some of them were probably more educated because some of them were hired as governesses. Now, you can't be a governess for children unless you know something. You have to have gone to school. And compulsory education was in this part of the empire at that time. So my grandmother, for instance, was a governess when, before she got married. Uh, it's around slightly later than this point of time because she got married in 1914. So it is a, a bit later, about 20 years later. But she was a governess, as was her sister. And uh, she spoke three languages. She spoke German, Italian, and French. So, uh, and she was a governess for children. Now, I want to talk about this next week because it is relevant to the topic I'm going to cover. I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to explain what I mean by this today, but it's relevant to the topic of illegitimacy. They're, the two are linked. Domestic service and illegitimacy in the 19th century are linked. And that's something I'm going to talk about next week. And I think you'll find that interesting, but I'm just going to give you that as a teaser. 
um, and kind of hop over that for now. Um, all right. So now a lot of people were saying, wow, uh, how come it's not agricultural? How come farmers are not the top of the list? Well, if you look at the statistics for the city, now remember, this is just for the city and it's and it's kind of suburban areas. If you look at the statistics, the the, there are fewer than 5% of the total population in Trento were involved in agriculture. Fewer than 5%. Now, honestly, that is upside down from the rest of the world, from the rest of the province anyway. In fact, I found, uh, I was trying to find some statistics, and I did today in this book, which is one of those journals I, I bought. And it uh, this is about the Judicari in the... Uh, in the 1800s and I looked up a couple of to see if it had anything similar to the survey that I had looked at for Toronto and it did it wasn't in 1890 these were from the 1840s hold on let me look up the year 1834 okay so it's slightly earlier but still 19th century and uh and actually probably I think with the exception of the military um it may not be that different from in terms of Trento. So this is now, I'm going to talk about two places. One is Tione. Tione is, uh, it, and it's the district of Tione. And the district of Tione then meant not just the town of Tione, uh, it meant the parish plus uh, Rendena, Val Rendena, and also parts of Pieve di Bono, which is not the same as Bono in Leggio. It's a different place. So these are all in the interior part of the Judicari, and it's quite a large area. Now, Tione itself is a kind of a town town. <laughs> it's a bit more built up. It's not like a city, but it's it's very it's a town. Uh, and but all the areas around it are very, very village like. OK, so now at that time in this uh, in this era, that whole area, the whole district, this is 1834, the total population was a little over 14,000 people. So it's smaller than the city, uh, but still quite big, but it's because it's spread out. Now, if you look at the figures, um, it lists only, uh, of this 14,000, this particular survey seems to have counted children because it only showed uh, fewer than 5,000 with occupation. So I'm assuming all the other people were kids or old people, so one or the other. But the only people who were employed uh, were about 4,800 people. So if you look at that, if you if you look at that, that uh, saying there are 4,800 people, and you look at the statistics, um, actually in Tioni area, 66% of the people were involved in farming, OK? They were either contadini or landowners for farmlands, 66%, as opposed to fewer than 5%, in Trento. So that's a huge contrast. Now, if you think that's big, I'm going to tell you about another town. The, the air, the, in this book again, the area around Condino, which is further south and right on the border, and in fact, it used to in those days include Valvestino, which is now part of Brescia. And it's a place I went to last year. It's a fantastic place. So wild and so rural, you wouldn't believe it really, 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 really rugged and wild and rural. That area, back in 1835, it said that there were, a t there was a total number of people of 9,500 people, so fewer than 10,000, 9,500 people, of which, get this, were 8,738 contadini. Now that's almost 90 two percent of the population were farmers okay so the more rural you go that's what you're going to see you're going to see this this change so really Trento was kind of like a it's almost like a third world and first world you know it's a real clash in terms of culture uh, Trento was very important culturally to to our ancestors but the difference in culture must have been amazing so I just wanted to bring those statistics to you because I thought they were really really interesting when I saw them so now, because I talked about the remedy, I don't really have much time to talk about uh, occupations that don't exist anymore, but I'm going to mention one. And this is something that I had, um, somebody actually mentioned it in the group, and it, uh, it, it's something called carbonaio. Now, carbonaio is a charcoal maker. 
Now, back in the past, charcoal was very, very important because uh, it, it could heat, it made smokeless heat, essentially. So it wasn't just used for cooking, it was used for smelting as well. It, it was very, very important in a lot of different aspects of life. Now, to make charcoal <laughs> is very, very intricate. And actually, people who were Karabonai had to live in the woods. They couldn't even live in the village. In fact, they spent, I think it said eight years, eight, eight months out of the year. I have to look this up. I think, it's, I think I wrote that down. Pretty much, pretty sure that's what they spent eight months of the year off in the forest because they had to go. Um, they have to go find trees because charcoal is made from trees. They had to go find the trees, uh, clear an area, build a hut made of the wood, um, and then gradually feed. It had a little hole. It's like a dome hut. And they used to feed the wood into the top uh, to let it cook, basically, very, very, very slowly. And there was a real art to it. It was very difficult. And also very dirty, very hot. <laughs> and it it actually commanded the attention, demanded the attention of the entire family. Whole families would move out. They would all, everybody would help. The women would have to take care of their kids and do this while everything is going on. Sometimes they would help with the charcoal as well. But it was a family occupation. It wasn't something that you could do part time. It was a full time thing for those eight months. And then they would only come back to the villages um, in the, in the, I guess it was in the colder weather when, when they could no longer be in that area. Uh, they, there's one day, I think they came down once a year to, uh, for a festival. There is actually in that area of Condino, there is a monument to them. I want to actually go see it um, because I think, uh, and a museum in uh, Bondone, I think is where it is. And let me just look up the town. Yes, it's in Bondone. Uh, it, to the Carbonaio. Now, to me, that's a lost occupation. Um, I want to mention one person in the group, or three people in the group, three sisters, Doreen, Susan, and uh, Donna uh, the, uh, in the group. They hired me to, to uh, do their tree a year or so ago. And one of their ancestors was actually a Carbonaio from Veneto, who fled during the wars of independence actually now he couldn't exactly just move to the city where did he go he went up 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 into uh, the top of Alrandena, where in the mountains that's where he went and i bring him up because they had a very interesting soprenome for their for their their surname was etro because it's not a trentino name uh, but his soprenome was i find this interesting was rallo de muri <laughs> And Rallo de Mori means Rallo of the Moors. Now, the Moor is the kind of catch all term that people used back then to describe uh, people from Northern Africa, is Islamic people from Northern Africa who had darker skin. And it was actually part of the, there's a lot of art around in those days uh, depicting Moorish culture. It was quite trendy back in the 19th century, 18th century and 19th century, the, the whole idea of Moorish. So I can't help but think that the sopranome, now I have no proof for this, but me personally, I can't, I can't help but think that the sopranome was given to him as a kind of a joke because they were blackened from the charcoal all the time. And he said, oh, he looks like a Moor, you know, he's got dark skin. So um, don't know, but it's the most unusual sopranome I've ever come across. So I kind of thought it had to have been uh, something to do with this occupation because I can't figure out where the heck it came from otherwise. But that's just my theory. Anyway, any of you got any carbonite in your family? I think it's a fascinating occupation and uh, and certainly would have had something to do with uh, you know, your family's history and uh, everything. So anyway, that's it for now. I've, I've actually managed to stay not too far over the half hour. Uh, as I said, next week, I'm going to be talking about the idea of illegitimacy. We're going to be uh, looking at, you know, like what what were the attitudes? How do you recognize it in documents? What were the rules around it? And also, I want to talk about an institution called the Santuario del Elaste that was in Trento in the 19th century, which was actually a cutting edge maternity home for women uh, and their children that was addressing the issue of rising illegitimacy and very, very much linked to the um, 
domestic service issue. So we'll be talking about that next week. So that's that's it for tonight. Hope you enjoyed that. Please let me know if you tried the recipe. Uh, I'll post the ingredients in the blog and or in the uh, in the group. And uh, please let, let, let me know if you tried it out and if you're safe from the plague. And uh, until then, ciao, ciao. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.